We're going to read more than verse 1. We'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ Dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And who, at whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Thus, the word of the Lord. Please be seated. My name is Lucas Bombach. I'm a pastor of uh, Reformation Presbyterian Church in Nampa, and it is a pleasure to be with the Lord's beloved church this morning. And I join you to worship on this Lord's Day, as we call it, the High Holy Day of Christendom. It is also, uh, as we call, the, uh, the day of, of the triumphal entry where Christ, uh, we remember him coming into Jerusalem. And it's also the Christian Sabbath. This is the day, the first day of the week. It is the Sabbath because of the resurrection of Christ, which we will come to shortly, uh, worshiping God for his crucifixion and resurrection next Sunday. But since every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday, we're going to bathe in, in the truths of the resurrection. And this is one of the reasons we've, we've come to Colossians, 
uh, I invite you to come to this ancient city of Colossae with me. Uh, it is a city that was nestled in the shadow of the mountains of Phrygia. Imagine it's bustling marketplace and is filled with the clamor of merchants. They're selling their fine garments that they're well known for. And, and there's an aroma of exotic spices. And picture the grand temple of Artemis with its imposing columns and intricate carvings, standing as a symbol of the pagan religion that dominated that city. It is in this setting that the Apostle Paul, that he sends his letter to the Colossians, and he's urging them to set their minds on heavenly things, on the things above, and not on the intricate carvings and the pagan religions that are surrounding them. And he's calling them to put to death their earthly desires, to serve Jesus Christ, to be united to Jesus Christ, to put off the old man and to put on the new man, and to stay away from the desires of the world that would ensnare them. Like the early Christians in Colossae, we too live in a world that is corrupt and it's hostile to the gospel. It's filled with distractions that seek to pull us away from our heavenly calling. But just as Paul's words brought encouragement and strength to the believers in Colossae, so too these words from Colossians can inspire us to fix our gaze on our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen King who sits now at the right hand of God, Christian, if you are resurrected with Christ, you must seek the resurrected kingdom, the resurrected king. If you are resurrected today, you must seek the resurrected kingdom, the resurrected king. Let's look at verse 1, which is the subject of our sermon today. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 1 begins with a word that leads off a conditional sentence, if, variously translated, uh, quite interesting how many different translations, uh, the New King James uh, seems to get it right that this really is the word if, a, in the Greek, if, uh, other translations say uh, therefore or since, but if then, if then you were raised with Christ, if Christian, and this is the, the beginning of the transition between the theology of the first part of Colossians, which is the beautiful theology of Jesus Christ, who, who is the one who came to save us from our sins, to reconcile us with God. And he came to suffer as a sacrificial servant. All this wonderful theology, which Paul usually comes to us in his letters with three chapters of theology in this case, and then three chapters of challenge for how you can apply this in your Christian life. And so this is where we are. We're at this turning point in the letter. If then all these things are true... If then all these things are true, what does that mean to you? How does that affect your life? And you see many commands in the following sentences. You know, stay away from filthy living, corrupt living. Stay away from treating your wives inappropriately and wives treating your husbands inappropriately and treating your children inappropriately and children treating your parents inappropriately. It's interesting to me to hear sometimes people say that the Old Testament is where we get all the commandments and the New Testament doesn't have any commandments. It looks like we get a whole lot of commandments here and we should take them seriously as from our resurrected king. But there's this question here, if, before you can go any further, you have to answer this question, are you raised with Jesus Christ? If you're not a believer here today, the answer is clearly no. And you should ask yourself, 
should I be, and is the Holy Spirit calling you to be resurrected with Christ? And if you're not sure, if you do believe in Jesus Christ in your mind, but you're not sure if you're regenerate, you should pay very close attention to the rest of this sermon. To the Colossians, their first problem uh, with this question, if they were raised or if they were resurrected, was that they hadn't died yet. And maybe you're there too. I haven't died, and so how can I be resurrected? This resurrection is a far-off reality. Uh, It's a gateway to eternal life. I'm not there yet. I'm still in this life. And it's especially tempting to think this way when you're young. This resurrection, I'm young. Uh, I'm invincible. This resurrection is not for me quite yet. When I get old, then I'll think about the resurrection. I'll think about eternal life then. That is a temptation for you children to avoid. You need to ask yourself, am I regenerate? And to the Colossians, uh, this was also a question of what does it mean to be united to Christ? Clearly, Paul is teaching that in Christ raised with Christ, it's actually en Christo, which can be translated in Christ, not just with Christ. It's okay to translate it with, but it is literally transliterated in Christ. Paul says that we were raised, past tense here, this is the aorist for you Greek scholars out there, as we look forward to Resurrection Sunday, we're confronted with this same problem that the Colossians had. Uh, We're looking forward to when we die in eternal life. But you're saying in the past I was resurrected. I'm confused. Is this resurrection a past history? This is something that happened to Jesus. And he died for me and he was resurrected. Yes, I, I understand that. But how am I resurrected in Christ? This is a past tense. I'm going to give a, a, a shout out to the King James here. The King James translates this as a present tense. And for those of you who, who know the heiress, it's a funny little tense, which sometimes can be past tense and actually can be a very real present tense. If ye be raised. And uh, all our modern translations translate this as a past tense. But what Paul here is saying by using the aorist and not the two or three other past tenses he could have used, what Paul is saying here is that you, if you are, if you are right now in your present reality, in your life today, without having died, without having a bodily resurrection, You are resurrected. Paul refers to resurrection in other places as a future resurrection. If you're not confused, now uh, you will be even more confused. Uh, Is this a past, a present, or a future? Based on union with Christ in the past, Romans 6, 5, he says, For if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will in the future certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. We will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Paul, the same man, is not confused. He's saying that it is a past, present, and a future reality. Previously in Colossians, Paul says this, You are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, Colossians 2.12. Again, the past tense. The King James translates are risen as a present tense. The application I have for you today, Christian, is this resurrection to you a past, present, or future reality? Have you ever even asked that question before? Does it even matter to you? Should it mean more in your life than it does? Paul refers to it in all three ways. Maybe you should think of yourselves 
in Christ as resurrected in every aspect of your life. Why does Paul say, if you are resurrected in Christ? Our day and age finds the concept of resurrection bizarre. Much of the mainline church has abandoned any belief in the resurrection. The mainline churches prefer naturalism and what they term science, what they call science, in opposition to God's mighty work of the resurrection. Can we as Christians dispense with the fact of the resurrection, which the Jews officially attempted to do and do today, to this very day, as recorded in Scripture, the Sanhedrin ordered the false testimony of Christ's stolen body to obscure the fact, the official fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is actually happens before he's resurrected because they know that this is the most dangerous thing that could happen to their religion, that Jesus Christ would be resurrected. <clears throat> Can we as Christians dispense with the resurrection? Can we as Christians, without believing the historic fact of the resurrection, can we believe a revisionist history and dispense with the scientific impossibility of resurrection? We have stories like Frankenstein, a science fiction which shows us the impossibility of bringing life from death, but speculates what it would be like. We understand that it's science fiction. We don't believe Frankenstein is possible. Even over 100 years after it was written, we still have had no evidence that resurrection is scientifically possible. <laughs> Can we Christians believe in another gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 3, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He's talking about Isaiah 53, that this was the Messiah that would come and suffer and would die. Can we, modern church, dispense with the resurrection and say that it's not possible? This is what Thomas Jefferson did in his Bible. Crossed out all the miracles. Said, I can have a moral Christianity. I like the morality of it. It helps us keep society together. <laughs> is that what Christianity is to you? Is it a tool to keep culture together, to keep your world from falling apart? Or is it a real reality, a real faith in a real Lord who really died and really was resurrected? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, you have believed in vain if you don't believe this. If Christ has not been raised our preaching is worthless, and so is your faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If the resurrection is not true, everything we're doing here today is worthless. All the preachers who come to this podium, if the resurrection is not true, coming to church on Sunday, if the resurrection is not true, is meaningless. We should be worshiping on Saturday. We don't worship on Saturday because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have lots of Seventh-day brothers who, they won't hear it. They won't hear Luke 24, that on the third day, it is now the third day, the first day of the week, it makes it very clear. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. That is the gospel. You will be saved if you believe Jesus Christ was resurrected. We cannot dispense with, I don't know how Christianity came this far that they thought they could dispense with the resurrection. God has raised this Jesus to life, 
to which we are all witnesses, Acts 2.32. This is Peter preaching the rationale of his faith that God has raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this. We are a resurrection religion. Harry Emerson Fosdick, the great liberal theologian of 100 years ago, wrote in 1922, just 100 years ago, I do not argue that Jesus rose from the dead. I simply say that it is a matter of faith and not a matter of fact. B.B. Warfield, a great man who defends the faith, says in his defense, the resurrection of Christ, he says, it is not possible to be a Christian and yet deny the resurrection. The resurrection is the central fact of Christianity. The resurrection of Christ is the seal of all his work. The resurrection of Christ is the miracle of miracles, the keystone of the arch of Christianity. To deny the resurrection is to deny the very heart of the Christian faith. If Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain, and we are yet in our sins and they that have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. The resurrection of Christ is the great fact of the Christian faith, the cornerstone of Christian doctrine, and the hope of Christian experience. How do we know, if you didn't know coming into church today, that the mainline churches were apostate churches you know now? Do not play games by saying that the apostate churches are maybe true believers as well, or that their pastors are preaching the truth. If they are, great. But the mainline churches have rejected the truth. Over 100 years ago, they rejected the truth, the plain truth of the Bible. They rejected the resurrection, the virgin birth. They rejected miracles. And we've been doing this for centuries. I mentioned Thomas Jefferson is one of the fathers of this modernist movement. Those churches that deny the resurrection life are not regenerate, and they cannot be in Christ if they deny the resurrection. The next problem confronting the Colossians is that they are being confronted with the reality of partaking in Christ's death and resurrection, not in a corporal manner, dying as martyrs, partaking in his death as martyrs, which was a very real possibility in that day. But the problem <clears throat> is that the past tense of the verb requires them to understand themselves as having been already resurrected, living a resurrection life now. Christian, are you resurrected Children, I'll, I'll ask you again, if you hear your parents talk about being regenerated by the Holy Spirit, that is being resurrected in Christ. The wages of sin is death. In your sins, you're dead. Those who are in Christ are resurrected. Born again, children, born again. Ask your parents, can I be born again too, mommy? I hope you'll all ask your parents that question today. It is essential that you be born again and resurrected in Jesus Christ. Little ones, consider Lazarus. Remember the story of Lazarus? Do you ever wonder what it was like to walk in the shoes of Lazarus? This was the man that was stinking in the grave. And he was resurrected in his body. In King's Elijah is recorded as resurrecting two dead children. And later, Elijah's bones are recorded as having resurrection power. His very bones, just touching the bones of the dead prophet Elisha, would bring you back to life. Do you live in the death and resurrection of Christ? Your bones have resurrection power like Elisha. Are you like Lazarus, evidence of a man who owes every ounce of his being to Christ? Does the resurrection have only symbolic significance for you today? That's the liberal church. It only has symbolic significance. Cry out to God to cleanse you of the philosophies of man if that's you today. 
Christian, if you came to Christ's call long ago, how can the resurrection sustain you indefinitely? Some of you have been Christians for a long time, and you may have just forgotten how significant the resurrection was in you. You've forgotten that your bones are holy now. We're reminded by the Lord in the Lord's Supper that we are to remember Christ and his love for us. But the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is not a mere memorial of something that happens, not just a mere symbol of something that happened. It's a reminder to you that you have life in you. You put Jesus in you, and that was... That life is Jesus' body. In his death, there is power. He was not held by death. And the same is true for you, not in a future sense, but now. In now, that's what the Lord's Supper is, is that now you have the life in you now. The body of Christ, you must take it into you now. And lots of disciples left Jesus over this doctrine. You know, if it's confusing to you, ask your pastors, ask your elders. I want to understand these. I want to find some books to understand the Lord's Supper better, to understand the resurrection better, to understand the significance of it in my life. Whenever you witness baptism, believers, God is communicating to you the resurrection of Lazarus happens now. It's It is alive and well. The resurrection of Lazarus is alive and well. What are you going to do with your second chance at life? What have you done? If the answer is, not much, brothers and sisters, confess your unbelief and live in the resurrection power of Christ. Do not have a form of godliness and deny its power. That's a dangerous place to be dancing on the fence between the temple of Artemis and the temple of the living and true God. It's not going to turn out well. Point number two, seek the kingdom of the resurrection. How practically can you live in this resurrection that we've described? described? Proverbs 8, 17, seek God. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Fix your eyes on things above. Seek those things which are above. Fix your eyes on things above. This is how you live in in the resurrection. You fix your eyes on things above, literally on resurrected things, not the temple of Artemis which looms over your city or the house of Simplot in this case. How do you do this? How do you live a new life in Christ? Put off the old man and put on the new man. When you're tempted to yell at your family, your coworkers, that's what this passage talks about. It talks about bosses and employees, bond servants and masters. Instead of doing that, go to them. Talk to them, love them, preach the gospel to them. Your children need to hear the gospel. Carping at each other. How is that working for you? Preaching the gospel to each other. Much better. If there's discipline problems in the church, elders, preach the gospel. Come with gentleness. Galatians 6.1. Put on the new man. And put off the old man. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying this is, an ama- this is an amazing reality. This resurrection of Jesus Christ is an amazing reality, and this is how you fix your eyes on things above. This is how you stop looking at the temple of Artemis. <clears throat> you put on heavenly things. And don't focus on the old things. Focus your eyes on the new life. Christ on the throne. Ultimately, fixing your eyes on Christ on the throne. What is above you, Christian? What do you seek first before the kingdom of God? We're very diligent in pursuing the things that we want. I was just at the store with my son, and he 
was very diligent about persuading me that he had to have this Lego set. And I said no, and then I caved, um, like, like God would cave to us you know, if we were persistent in seeking him. And we wanted to see his face. We wanted his presence in our lives, and we weren't satisfied living this sort of half-baked, lukewarm life. How can you live in the resurrection kingdom reality? Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, Matthew 6, 33. I know women, not just women, but I know there's some women, maybe one or two, that worry a lot. Put your family, put your children, put your marriage in God's hands, in the resurrected God's hands, the almighty God's hands. Do you worry about your life, what you'll wear, and what, you know, what size house you'll have? Or do you say, to live is Christ and to die is gain? Live in the reality of union with Christ as if you, if you had <clears throat> hope, you have hope. And you don't need to worry. I was actually reading in Scripture this morning. It says, you, if you take everything away from me, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, Job, it was um, Habakkuk. If you take everything away from me, I'll still praise you. If you have the resurrection life, you don't worry about losing your life or anything. You have a great grounds of assurance. Jesus Christ... The kingdom of God is based on Jesus Christ becoming the God-man, taking on flesh. This is your greatest assurance. He is God in the flesh, for in him dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. This is the great theology. Because he is Christ incarnate, he made a way for your flesh to be saved, not just your soul. We don't live a duplicitous life. Not just your soul, body and soul. Your body belonged. Do you remember the bones? Why do you think the bones had power? Is the Old Testament just a bunch of superstition? No. Your body belongs to Jesus Christ. You were bought, all of you, not part of you. Your whole body belongs to him. Everything you do belongs to him. He is your master. He is your king. He came in the flesh to make a way for your flesh to be saved. We have a kingdom of body and soul. He wants the whole world that he made to be his. Is that too much to ask? Is that too much for an almighty God to ask, the one who created all things? The resurrection is for this world. It is for now. The Lord's Prayer says the same thing, on earth as it is in heaven. The resurrection is for this world now and the world to come. You see, Paul, all this theology is just working together. Paul's hitting on all cylinders. He's not giving up any territory. Past, present, and future. The God who was and is and is to come. We should be seeking the kingdom of God, not focusing on worldliness. Seeking God is living in the Galatians 5 works. Uh, seeking, not seeking God is living in the Galatians 5 works of the flesh, repeated here. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, covetousness. Put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Colossians 3.8. Seek God where he may be found, believers. Seek to live in that kingdom reality. Our last point, focusing on Christ the King, our resurrected King. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, did you know that every sermon in Acts starts with Jesus being crucified and ends with him being on the throne of heaven? Go read through Acts. Look at all the sermons. What is the result does he just die on a cross? And that's it. 
No, if he did, and he didn't rise and ascend to the throne of heaven, we wouldn't have the same God. Every time that message cuts to the heart of the people that hear it, the people who murdered Jesus were converted, thousands of them in Jerusalem. The very people that murdered Jesus, they, they welcome him on Palm Sunday as he triumphantly enters the city. They murder him the next Sunday, and then they're all being converted. What a great plan of salvation that God used these events to try the souls of men. I hope he's doing that for you this morning, and I hope you respond positively to his call. Christ is the risen, victorious king. There is no other reality. He's the risen and victorious conqueror of Psalm 110. Psalm 110. If you say, well, there wasn't Jesus in the Old Testament, you're not paying attention to Psalm 110, which is quoted over and over and over again, that the Lord says to my Lord, sit at right hand, my right hand, and I will make your enemies your footstool. God, the Father, saying to God, the Son, you will be risen. You will be victorious. You will be seated in heaven. This is the message the Jews did not want to hear, but they did hear when Peter preached it. This is the risen God sitting on his throne. Sit at my right hand. I will make your enemies your footstool. You will be victorious. That's what that means. If your enemies are serving as a piece of furniture for your feet, you have defeated them. You have defeated the vice in your life. Put it underneath your feet where it belongs, where the serpent belongs. Those sins that you've been cherishing, put them beneath your feet just as the risen king of heaven has shown you. He has done. There is no other reality. The cross is the most important image of what happens to sinners in their sin. The next most important image is that Christ is sitting on his throne, an image of the resurrection power of God whom death cannot conquer. He's undefeated, unvanquished. That's the kingdom that we're seeking on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our king has come. Why did he come on a donkey? What's the symbolism there? Why didn't he come and slay everybody that was against him? Like it says in Psalm 110, he's going to fill the valleys with corpses. Why didn't he do that? Why did he come on a donkey, not on a war horse? What does the Lord require? Seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. Jesus walked humbly. He came to die because that's what we had earned, is death. He took on our flesh, and he was humble because we are not. He was humble because we needed a substitute to be humble for us. And we cling to his garments as he rises to heaven. We needed to die. He didn't need to die. But he came to die for us. We thought we needed power, a warhorse king. We needed the resurrection. We were dead in our sins. The suffering servant is what we needed. Isaiah 53, that by his stripes we might be healed. We needed healing. Lazarus profoundly needed healing. I'm so thankful that God gave us Lazarus as an example of who we are. Dead, stinking, rotting in our sins. Every time you are in discord in the Christian home, you're stinking in your sin. The Christian home should be a holy place. A holy place. That's the message he's giving us in Colossians. We have a high, holy, resurrected king. Our homes are holy places of 
of, should be places of worship, not places for, for these works of the flesh. We needed a Godhead to dwell in its fullness in, this, in the flesh to be our representative. We needed a representative to die. Can you imagine Brad Little or Russ Fulcher or Mike Simpson dying for you? What good would that do? Absolutely no good at all. Not any good at all. But the substitutionary death of Christ means everything. It means everything. What is the image of Christ that Paul commands believers to seek? What's the image that he commands you to seek? That's the, that's the verb in this passage. Seek, 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 seek. What is the image he commands you to seek? It's Jesus on the cross? Yes, because he was obedient even to death. But that's not the image he gives here. The Im image he gives here is that Jesus is sitting on the throne, resurrected, ascended, and having been resurrected, ascended, you in Christ are sitting at the right hand of glory. In Christ, you are resurrected today, not tomorrow, not in a thousand years, today. This is a Christus Victor picture. We live in the reality of Christ's victory over death. Take the crucifixes out of your house and fix your eyes on the resurrected king who's no longer hanging on the cross. Beloved congregation, let us fix our eyes on the powerful words of Colossians 3.1, on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Our ultimate allegiance is not to the false gods of this world, gender transformation, days of vengeance, the gospel of humanism. In union with the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you as a reborn, regenerate, new creation, must strive to cultivate a heavenly mindset. Focusing on Christ, our victor. That means putting off the things of this world, a small price to pay. The death of this world. It's dead idols. And putting on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. As we go from this place, I pray that the Holy Spirit equips us to Resist the world and to live in the reality of the victory of the kingdom of God. The reality of the victory of the kingdom of God. Not victorious someday. Victorious now. May our lives be transfigured by the gospel of Jesus Christ who defeated death and is sitting at the right hand of glory. And let us have that hope as our present reality. Psalm 1611 expresses the joy and the pleasure of God's path of life. It says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all for now and forevermore. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, uh, we come to your throne thankful, putting on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. We vow to you, Lord, that we are ready to live in this present reality, in all of our dealings with men, but especially in our dealings with you, Lord in the reality of the path of life that you've set before us, that we are ready now, not at some point in the future. We're ready now, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts. We patiently await your Spirit, its ministry to us. We pray that you would give us the words to, to pray to you, Lord. But if not, that you would hear our groanings that are too deep for words, that we would just come to you as, as helpless children, groaning for your salvation, groaning for your resurrection power. 
and rejoicing that our flesh and our souls can be redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, the right hand of glory, interceding for us forever. Amen.